Thanks. Thank you, Shane. Arigato. Oh, I couldn't. Well, maybe just a bite. Get the interest. Brought the pie. brought the pie. <laughs> I love that line. This week someone alerted me to an article that showed up in the Calgary Herald about Pastor Ray Matheson, who is the congregational care minister at a sister church of ours in Calgary, uh, First Alliance Church. <clears throat> the article told the story of <clears throat> Ray's relationship with Ralph Klein, who, as you know, was the premier of Alberta for 14 years. Well, as the story goes, one day a couple of years ago, Ralph was in a car with one of his close friends, and they're just driving along a well-known uh, highway in Calgary. And uh, Ralph had not been well that year. He had actually been diagnosed with uh, a progressive form of dementia. And his impending death was heavy on his heart. And so as they were driving past First Lions Church, Ralph pointed to the bu building, the church building, and he said, I've put it in my will that I want Ray Matheson to do my funeral. Now, Ray's friend, or sorry, Ralph's friend in the car with him was a member of First Alliance and a friend of Ray's. And so he relayed that conversation to Pastor Ray. And not long after that, Ray came to visit Ralph in his home. So the first thing Ray says is, I understand you want me to do your funeral. And Ralph says, yes, if you would. Now, something you need to know about Ray Matheson, there on the right. Ray's a very effective evangelist. And over the years, he's, le he's led so many people to the Lord that people have given him a nickname. They call him One-A-Day Ray. <laughs> I don't know if it's One-A-Day, but he, uh, his uh, sister, Marion Ratzlaff, is a member here at Gateway. And you can ask her. I'm not exaggerating. He really leads a lot of people to Jesus. So when Ray sits down with Ralph, and he finds out that he's going to be doing his funeral, he says... I just want to be sure that you're ready to die. And that when you die, you'll go to heaven and have assurance of that. And Ralph responds, yes. Tell me how to be sure. So Ray just tells Ralph right there the way to heaven. That is by grace. In other words, it's not dependent on how good you were or how many times you went to church or how many good deeds you've done. Ray says, the Bible says it's not by good works that you're saved but it's through recognizing that we're all sinners 
And we've all fallen short of God's standard. And that's what grace is. It's something you can't earn by your own efforts. Then Ray tells Ralph about how believing in Jesus, who died for our sins, is what brings us that forgiveness of God. Ray says Jesus was crucified to pay the penalty of your sin, Ralph, so that he rose from the dead so that you can have eternal life. And then Ray says, God offers us a gift. The gift of his forgiveness. The free gift of eternal life. The gift of peace with God. And he says, and like every other gift, it has to be received to be enjoyed. Then Ray leaned forward in the conversation, reached out his hand, and knocked on the coffee table in Ralph's den. And he says, Ralph, Jesus is knocking. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and we'll be friends. Ray says to Ralph, would you like to open the door to Jesus? And then this former premier, this powerful leader, this one who they used to call King Ralph, looks at Ray and he says, yes, I would like to open the door to Jesus but I don't know how to do it. And so Ray led him through a prayer of salvation. He just admitted that he sinned. He communicated that Jesus, he believed, died on the cross for his sins and rose from the dead. And then he committed his life to following Christ. And Ray says, Ralph seems so very happy and enthusiastic after that. When his wife Colleen came home later that day, he gave her a big hug and expressed how Glad he was for his newfound sense of freedom. And then in the article, Pastor Ray says that Ralph started attending church services at First Alliance after that. But a few months later, his health got so bad that he had to be hospitalized. hospitalized. And then his dementia progressed, and they moved him into a long-term care facility. And then just over a week ago, on Good Friday, of all days, on Good Friday, Ralph Klein passed away into eternity. But just four days before he died, Ray made the last of several visits to his friend Ralph. Ralph Klein was more lucid that day than he had been in months. He knew his death death was imminent. And he says, Ray says that he was very much at peace with it. And so when he walked in the room, Ralph says, my ship is going to sail soon. And Ray said to his friend, it's going to sail to a good place, Ralph. You're going to be with Jesus. And the two of them talk about heaven, and Ray noticed that Ralph looked so peaceful and seemed so joyful. And during their final prayer together, Ray shared with Ralph verses from chapter 14 of John's Gospel, where Jesus describes heaven, saying, In my Father's house there are many wonderful rooms, and I'm going to go there to prepare a place for you. And um, Ray shared with him how in that chapter Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but through me. And then he encouraged Ralph to be encouraged thanking God that he had been forgiven, that there was a place for him in heaven. And as a result of Jesus' resurrection and the saving grace in Ralph's life, that he had nothing to fear. Ralph grabbed Ray's hand and held on tightly as they prayed one last time together. And in the article, Ray summed up Ralph's journey with Jesus by saying, I'm confident that Ralph is with Jesus and that he's in heaven. He has a full and keen mind, even better than what he had in his prime. And he's whole in every way. Now, when I heard that story and read it, I don't know about you, but my heart was just so filled with gratitude for God's grace. Isn't that incredible? And, you know, when I read it, I was just so filled with gratitude that 74 years ago, a small group of people in the city of Calgary decided to pray And start a church. I mean, planning a church back then at the end of the Depression could not have been an easy thing. I'm sure there were many, many sacrifices that people had to make as they prayed, as they gave of their time, and as they gave of their money. And yet, because there were a bunch of people, just a small group, people who aren't even alive today that made those sacrifices, there's this glorious impact for the gospel right there in Calgary. And people like Ralph Klein are saved from an eternity of separation from God. And they're brought into the kingdom of Jesus, both now and for all eternity. And that's just one church. 
in one city. It's awesome. When you hear stories like this, doesn't it just make you excited to be part of the kingdom of God? Aren't you just so grateful that God has given you an opportunity to pray and serve and give so that the church can be the church and tell people about Jesus and bring the kingdom into our reality now in our series of messages that we've been going through on and off through September to now called Encounter. We've been talking about the goodness that God had in mind. The goodness when he created the world in Genesis 1 and 2 describes a world that God made and over and over it says God saw that it was good. And as we've seen, the world that God designed was built in with environmental goodness, where the world takes care of us as we take care of it. The world was made with relational goodness as we love and minister to others as they do the same for us. The world was made for physical goodness as people value and take care of the bodies that God gave them so that we can serve Him more effectively. The world was designed with societal goodness in mind, a fair and just civilization where everybody can flourish. And finally, the world designed that God designed, put many material resources in our hands. And he gave us a mind to create these resources and to develop them and to expand them and to use them to bring about the kingdom of God, to expand the Garden of Eden so that it would cover all the earth. And so as we've seen over and over, these twin themes of temple and kingdom, connection and reflection in the biblical story, And in creation, the connection that Adam and Eve enjoyed in God's temple resulted in the reflection of his kingdom, the goodness of his kingdom in the garden. And so today and for the next couple of weeks, I do want to just speak to you a little bit more about that last aspect of goodness there, material goodness. And we can actually have series where we'll be dealing with other aspects of goodness, but material goodness, you know, one of the things that happens in a person's heart when they are transformed by God's love when they're connected with him, is that they develop a fresh perspective on the things that God has given them. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And the point there is what that video was saying. The whole pie belongs to him. It's God's pie. He baked it and he gave it to us. And so it doesn't surprise us to learn then that God wants us to at least devote a portion of that pie to him and to the building of his purposes, his kingdom on earth. Now, if we look back at the story of Ray and Ralph Klein coming to faith, let's ask, how did that come about? Let's ask, who played a part in that miracle of salvation? Obviously, salvation is the work of God, but God works through people. And so I think it's fair to ask, who pays for the mortgage on the church building that Ralph pointed at that day? Who pays the pastor's salary when he goes to visit Ralph in his home? Who pays for the lights and the heat to be on when Ralph started coming on Sunday mornings to participate in worship as a baby Christian. And on and on we go. We don't always think about this, but what happens in First Alliance in Calgary and in churches all over the world is simply this. People who've been so wonderfully connected with God's mercy and love have been transformed by that relationship and they long for others to hear about and to come into an an experience of God's grace. And so they pray for the salvation of others. And they minister and give of their time and their spiritual gifts. And they also give of the material resources that God has placed into their lives. They give a slice of the pie that God has given them so the kids can have ministry where they hear about Jesus. So that youth have programs that they can build positive friendships and be discipled into faith in order that missionaries might be sent overseas to spread the good news, and on and on. Now, as we get back to the biblical story, we see that God gives humanity everything that they need to obey His command, to reflect and expand His kingdom on earth. Starting with Adam and Eve, though, humanity makes the conscious decision to disconnect from God, that sin. And in Genesis 3, that loss of connection with God results in a loss of reflection of His goodness environmentally, physically, relationally, society, and also in material goodness. As we saw in the drama last week, God continues to pursue the people that he loves. His heart is broken that the relationship is not close. He doesn't give up easily on us. And God calls Abraham, uproot your family and go to a land where you can build my kingdom. The Bible tells us in order to fulfill this mandate, God blesses Abraham with servants and sheep and even a promised child. 
In other words, he's given everything he needs to do what God has asked him to do. After all, Abraham is the one who coins the name for God, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord provides. Now, after winning a great battle, Abraham meets Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And the Bible says that uh, this king was also the priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, and then Abram, or Abraham later as he came to be known, felt compelled in his spirit to give him a tenth of everything. And that's where we're introduced to this idea of the tithe. A tithe is where God asks us to devote the first 10% portion of our income, that first 10% slice of the pie that he's given us, to devote it to him. Now, as we follow along then with the biblical narrative, the people of Israel move to Egypt, and later on they're enslaved. But God sends them a deliverer, and so Moses leads them out of Egypt. But God moves the Egyptians' hearts before they do so to give the people of Israel gifts of gold and silver. As we learned in our encounter series, once the people arrive at Mount Sinai, the first thing God asks Moses to do is to take up a free will offering. And so the people devote back to the Lord some of the gold and the silver that the Egyptians gave them in order for the tabernacle to be built. Then a number of times in the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible that Moses brought together, God tells Moses a tithe of everything from the land. Whether we're talking about grain or fruit, all of it belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And so, giving God's tithe back to him, that 10% first portion, is enshrined as a standard of material goodness in the Old Testament law. Now, later in our story, as we go along, the people enter into the promised land, and God provides them with everything they need to reflect and to expand the kingdom goodness of God. And every year, the people are instructed to bring their tithe into the Lord's treasury, first at the tabernacle and later at the temple. And additional offerings were also often given on top of the tithe. And you see, the reason for these tithes and offerings were twofold. First of all, the tithe was a spiritual discipline that trained the people, here's how to trust God. Here are some baby steps to trusting God. As you're aware, it's very hard to trust somebody with your finances. Imagine handing somebody your credit card or handing them access to your bank account, right? You need to trust them a lot to do that. Well, God knew that if people can't trust him with the first 10% of their resources, they would never learn to trust him with the real treasures of their lives, their children, their health their heart. So the tithe was a, a starting point for trusting in God. But secondly, as we've seen, the tithe was given to fund the mission that God had given the people of Israel, to establish the kingdom of God in the promised land, and to expand the kingdom of God all over the earth, to create a compassionate society where those with needs were cared for. And that's why in addition to the tithe, landowners were asked not to harvest to the very edges of their field, but to leave something for the poor to glean in the corners. The tithe was used to fund annual festivals of celebration and solemn assemblies where God's word would be read and where the people would repent and pray. The tithes and offerings were used to support the ministry of the priests and the Levites as they were to keep the tabernacle and later the temple in working order as a place of forgiveness and a house of prayer for all the nations to come and to learn about God so that they might take that relationship back to their countries with them. But sadly, over the years, the spiritual leaders of Israel mismanaged the tithe and the offerings, and the people stopped giving them. And not long after the splendor of Solomon's temple was dedicated to the Lord, Israel entered into a thousand-year slide into degradation, division, because of their idolatry. By the time of Malachi, one of the last prophets of Judah, the people were in deep trouble. The northern tribe of Israel had been carried away off to Assyria, and Malachi was warning the southern tribe of Judah with these words, where will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. And then he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And God really just says here what he's been saying all along. He says that God's people who give according to God's word will never lack God's resources 
to fulfill God's purposes. That's a mouthful. So let me say it again. God's people who give joyfully to God's word, according to God's word, will never lack God's resources to fulfill God's purposes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 says, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. You know, the only time in the Bible that God says, I want you to test me in this, is when it comes to just giving according to his word. Now, here at Gateway, God has given us, given us so many opportunities, many opportunities to share the good news of Jesus with the people in our community or the people who work where we work or our family and our friends. So many opportunities to reflect and to expand the kingdom of God by caring for those with needs, opportunities to plant churches in nearby communities or in Phnom Penh, opportunities to partner with our international workers who share the message of God's hope with people all over the world. But like in every other church in the world, the ministries here at Gateway are dependent upon the prayers and the volunteer time and the generous giving of God's people. And God moves in our hearts to provide the, to do those things. Like the people of God during Malachi's time, God has promised that he'll give us what we need to build his kingdom, but we've got to open our hands. And God's people who still give according to God's word, I believe will still never lack God's resources to fulfill God's purposes. Now, as we move along in our biblical story, we get to the time of Jesus, and Jesus spends just a ton of time talking about how we handle our money. Did you know that? If you read the Gospels, you see this again and again. You see, Jesus seems to realize that giving that first slice of the pie to God is an important starting point where the kingdom begins to take root in our hearts. And some people say that the wallet is the last place to get saved, but Jesus seems to expect that it's the first place that you begin to see a transformation once the person has developed a relationship with Jesus. And for example, you've got this diminutive tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus who comes to see Jesus, and you know the story. He wants to see Jesus, climbs up in the tree. Jesus comes by and invites himself over to, get to the guy's house. He says, okay, let's go. And the people around him are so, so shocked that Jesus would actually spend time hanging out with such a crooked tax collector but Zacchaeus is so transformed in the love and presence of Christ that he declared, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And it's at that moment Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Now, Zacchaeus didn't pay for salvation. You can't pay for it. But Jesus seems to think that a transformed heart will be demonstrated. How? With open hands. And by the way, did you know that about half of the parables that Jesus told have something to do with how we handle money and possessions? Jesus said more about money than any other subject, and so we have in the Bible 500 verses about prayer, 500 verses about faith, but there are more than 2,000 verses about money and possessions. Why does God put such an emphasis on how we handle our money? Again and again, it's about our heart. Jesus points out that God can't get a if He can't get a grip on your checkbook, he doesn't have a hold on your heart. But what about the tithe? Does Jesus wipe out the tithe? This idea that we should give 10% of our income right off the top? Well, actually, contrary to popular belief, Jesus doesn't get rid of the tithe, but he expands upon it. And so if you listen to Jesus in Matthew 23, 23, he's talking to the Pharisees, and he says, how terrible for you teachers of religious law, you, you legalistic Pharisees, hypocrites. You're so careful to tithe even the tiniest part of your income, but you ignore the most important things of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe, yes, but you should not leave undone the more important things. Now, what's going on here is Jesus is talking to people who are very legalistic. They, you know, good, okay, one for you, God, nine for me. One for you, nine for me. Right down to even like their spices. They're just really on bean counters. But then they walk away and they're like, wow, what a great person I am. God really owes me now. I'm really a spiritual person. I'm in the big leagues. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, you should tithe. But let's not forget about the more important things of God's kingdom. Love, mercy, justice, and faith. And so with these words, Jesus is affirming what we find in the Old Testament about tithing. But he's expanding on material goodness and saying, you think you're a big shot because you give the tithe. But Jesus says, you know, there are a lot more important things. And so you need to understand that the tithe is important, but it's kind of grade one stuff. The tithe is what you do when you first start to follow me. In other words, Jesus is pointing out 
that the tithe is beginner level discipleship. It's milk. It's not meat. It's something the baby Christians struggle with, but we move from there to more other important things of expanding the kingdom values of justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus says you should tithe. Yes, but don't stop there and think you've arrived. Now, the further that we move into the story of the Bible and the further we go, we find that the tithe no longer has the same emphasis as it does in the Old Testament. Because having established the importance of taking that first 10% and giving it as it belongs, as holy to the Lord, the New Testament builds now on establishing that we're to be generous beyond the tithe. And that generosity is what needs to motivate us as Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit. In the early church, the book of Acts records that these brand new Christians are just eagerly selling their possessions and laying the money at the feet of the apostles to su support the expansion of the kingdom of God. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul encourages the Corinthians to willingly and generously take up a special offering to assist the poor who live in Jerusalem. And so building on the tithes and the offerings that we find in the Old Testament, the New Testament lifts up the principle of generosity as the ultimate ethic for material goodness in the followers of Jesus Christ. But why? Why do we cut that first slice out of the pie and give it to the Lord? Why do we give tithes and additionally offerings as God leads us in order to become generous people? First of all, it's because of the spiritual discipline that trains us to trust in God. As I said before, can God do more with $9 than I can do with $1? There's only one way to find out. I've seen him prove over and over again that he can do more with nine than I can do with ten. But if I can't give that first slice of the pie to the one who brought me the pie, how does that, what does that tell you about the condition of my heart? Now, some people, they ask me, and I, I'm glad they ask. They ask, Steve, come on, let's be honest. Aren't you awkward about talking about money? Because, I mean, your salary is paid by the offerings that are taken up on a Sunday morning. And so my answer is, no, I'm actually not awkward about it at all. Not anymore. First of all, I'm not begging for money. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm giving you an opportunity to decide what to do with that information. Uh, we'll give you opportunities to give, and we'll tell you about what God does with that, but I don't know who gives what to, to Gateway Church, and I don't care to know. Secondly, I'm not awkward about this because I'm responsible to train and equip people in terms of what God's Word says. It's just my job. It's what I went to Bible college and seminary for. And since God's Word has a ton of information about how you manage your financial resources, I just can't fail to share that information with you. God says at the judgment seat of Christ that I will be judged more harshly because I'm a teacher of the Word of God. I will have to give an account for whether I boldly and unapologetically declared what the Word of God says, popular or unpopular. So it doesn't make me awkward when I think of it that way. Third of all, just in case anybody wonders... I don't make more or less based upon what people give from week to week. <laughs> of course, if nobody gave anything, I wouldn't make anything. But, I mean, the decision about my salary is made by the board. I'm not involved in those conversations, so just, just in case somebody here wondered. And finally, I'm not awkward about this topic because Jesus tells us that there's an amazing eternal reward that he will give to people who are generous with their money. And so I don't... I don't feel in any way that I'm being, doing a disservice to you by telling you about this incredible reward that you receive when you give generously from the pie that God has given you. So we give the Lord's tithes and our offerings because it's a spiritual discipline that teaches us to trust. But that's not all. We're generous because it funds the expansion of the kingdom of God. I love, I would love it if prayer would turn off on the lights. If, if we could just walk into the building and prayer would pay for the electricity bill, that would be a wonderful thing. Or if prayer would pay for the heat, uh, or for our mortgage, or whatever. But the reality is that God has determined this, this is how we're going to do it. In addition to prayer and service, that God is going to use the physical resources that he's put into your hands as you give of them to support the expansion of his kingdom. And so that you would learn that God's people who give according to God's word will never lack God's resources to fulfill God's purposes. Now, I started telling you about this message by explaining this story of Pastor Ray Matheson, who introduced Ralph Klein to Jesus Christ. And I would like to end this message by talking to you a little bit about the story of my mother-in-law. Her name is Bonnie. Some of you know this, but um, 
Over a year ago, Krista's mother was diagnosed with something called frontotemporal dementia. It's actually a very similar to the progressive dementia that Ralph Klein had. And so for the past few months, it's been difficult for us as a family to see her, my mother-in-law, Chris's mom, to see her going downhill. She's losing words. She's acting in inappropriate ways. Unless the Lord heals her in a miraculous way, it won't be very long and she won't be with us. And so as a family, we would appreciate your prayers. Please pray for us. But in the midst of our pain, I would like to tell you what, as a family, gives us hope during this time. Almost 40 years ago, when Krista was just a little baby, Ray Matheson, the same guy who led Ralph Klein to the Lord, Ray Matheson met with my father-in-law. My father-in-law was trying to sell him insurance, life insurance. Get this. Ray wasn't a pastor at the time. But in return, Ray gave my father-in-law eternal life insurance by introducing him to Jesus Christ. Didn't I tell you he's one a day, Ray? <laughs> awesome. Like Ralph Klein, my father-in-law, and then later on my mother-in-law, so Harry and Bonnie, became followers of Jesus. And I will always be eternally grateful that Ray just spoke up and told him about Jesus one day and took a business transaction and made it into a spiritual transaction. I'm so grateful that my wife Krista grew up in a home where Jesus Christ was honored as Lord. So grateful. But you know, it wasn't just Ray. The young family started attending Hillsdale Alliance Church in Regina where they lived. And it was the entire church that supported this evangelism, that supported them in their discipleship and walked with them in their newfound faith. And now it's the same church today that is walking with them in this difficult moment of their lives, this difficult season. I am so grateful to Hillsdale Alliance Church in Regina, Saskatchewan for their ministry to Christus family 40 years ago until this very moment. What I'm trying to tell you is that everybody in that church played a part in my mother-in-law and my father-in-law coming to Jesus. Everybody who prayed for that church, everybody who served in that church, and every single person who generously gave to the Lord played a part in them coming to faith. And that's what gives us hope these days. Because no matter what happens to my mother-in-law, if she's healed or if she experiences the ultimate healing of going to be with Jesus, we know that her eternity is safe in the arms of Jesus. Because 40 years ago, this church reached out to her and shared with her the message of God's love. I am so grateful for the ministry of that church. You know what? That kind of ministry is happening all over the place here at Gateway and the other churches of our community. You know, last Sunday at our eight, uh, sorry, 6.30 a.m., yes, a.m., Easter sunrise service, we baptized four people. So you can see the crowd there. Lindsay and Regan led us in worship, which was great, and Brent led, Brent led us in a great word from the Bible. And there were so many people that we ran out of communion cups, and they had to go and get some more, and uh, they poured them out quickly, and just incredible experience. So many amazing testimonies. Chris is here in the audience. There he is up on there. Huh? And Chris shared how last year at this time he was in prison. And there in his cell, after receiving things from a friend, information about Jesus Christ, books, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he's coming to Gateway. It's great. Great to have you here, Chris. God bless you, man. Awesome. Jesse was next. He's a youth who's grown up at a Christian home. And he looks a little cold. <laughs> and he talked about the life change that took place when he attended one of our youth programs, Blast. Our youth leaders, you should have seen them. Their faces were just beaming with joy. Awesome. It doesn't get more awesome than that. Amanda was next. You heard her share 
from the front a few weeks ago. She heard about Jesus, came to faith in Christ through our youth program, Blast, had not grown up in the church. Now she's serving in Axis and sensing God is asking her to enter youth ministry as a career and as a calling. Awesome! That's awesome. And finally came Sarah. Sarah spoke of how she lost her mother at the age of 18 and the deep grief that just covered her since that time. She spoke about how after coming to Gateway with her fiancé, Reuben, she's come to the place where she's personally given her life to Jesus Christ, received his mercy and his grace, is heaven-bound, and now God has begun to heal the wound in her heart as he's poured his love into her by the spirit which he's given her. What do we want to say to that? Awesome! That's it. There's just no other word for it. My friends, all of us at Gateway here are playing a part in this glorious expansion of the kingdom of God. Every person, you're praying. God bless you for praying. You're serving and using your spiritual gifts. God bless you for serving. And you're giving of the resources that God has placed in your hands. We just can't minimize the importance of that. God has given you a pie, and you take the first 10% slice of the pie, and off the top it goes to him. And we're motivated by the principle of generosity, and so as the Lord gives us means to do so. We gladly, not under compulsion, but gladly give as the Lord blesses us so that we can be a blessing to the world. Are you with me? Are you with me? Because when you gave, because you gave, because you served, because you prayed. We had two services last week that were packed out with people who watched a drama of the heart of God who reaches out to humanity. Because you gave, because you prayed, because you served, our kids program that is offered on Sunday morning. Get this, it's so exciting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What do those represent? Eight kids gave their lives to Jesus Christ last week in that program right there. Awesome. Eight young souls saved and transformed for eternity. How did this happen? Because the Lord Jesus Christ died for them. And he loves them and he pursues them and draws them into his family. But also because Christians are so deeply connected with God that they pray and they serve and yes, they give. Because you give. The lights in the auditorium here turned on when I entered this morning. I flicked the switch and the lights came on. Because you gave. Because you gave, our international workers like the Browns and the Lobbyists and the Dubais can reach the least reached people in the world and hear for the first time that there's a God who loves them. Because you prayed, because you served, and because you gave our weekly youth and kids church programs that run right here in this building, minister the love of Jesus. Because you prayed and served and gave, the people in your community can receive practical help, like receiving groceries when they've lost their job or paying for their rent. Because you prayed and served and gave, the kingdom of God is expanding both here and around the world. Are you with me? What can I tell you? God's people who give according to God's word will never lack God's resources to fulfill God's purposes. My friends, what happens when you give to the Lord? You fund ministry. You prayers and servers and givers, you played a huge role in these eight kids coming to faith last week. And those four people being baptized in the freezing cold waters of the Grand River, you played a part in that. People like Ralph Klein and people like my own mother-in-law, Bonnie, their eternity has been forever transformed. How? Because people prayed. Because people served. And also because people gave. People just like you. Thank you for giving your tithes and offerings. We're building the kingdom of God one soul at a time. Let's pray. Just invite you to close your eyes. We're moving into a time of communion together, and the scripture that I want for you to meditate upon is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, and the Apostle Paul is teaching believers in Corinth about the principle and the joy of generosity. And to do this, he points to the example of Jesus, and here's what he says. In talking about Jesus, 
coming to earth and dying for our sins, he says, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Lord Jesus, you were rich. You enjoyed all the riches of heaven with your father, but you gave it all up to become poor. Lord, why did you do this? Your word tells us that you became poor so that through your poverty, we might become rich. Heavenly Father, help us to meditate upon that verse. Help us, Lord, to soak in the truth that is contained in that passage of Scripture. Help us to examine our hearts, O oh Lord. Father, we take some time now in our service to ask you to forgive us for our sins. Search us, O oh Lord, and see if there's anything that needs to be that needs to be confessed. Help us to think about the body of Jesus that was broken as demonstrated in the bread that we're about to eat. Help us to think about the blood that was shed as demonstrated by the cup. Lord Jesus, we thank you that though you were rich, yet for our sakes you became poor, so that through your poverty we might become rich. Amen. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've received his mercy and grace, as Ray explained to Ralph, then we welcome you to the table. This isn't our table. This is the Lord's table. You're welcome to come. If you would like to become a Christian, if you would like to receive the freedom and the forgiveness that Jesus Christ offers, I'll be sitting right here in the front row. Come and talk to me. Or you can go into our prayer room and someone can pray for you there. However you want to just take an opportunity to pray, to come into the family of God. Come to the front. For those of you who know Christ, you can give to the Compassion Fund, to those who are in need by placing money in the offering. And when you're ready, take of the cup, take of the bread, and you can eat it when you're ready. As you do, please do so in remembrance of him.